Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Killer Bites. It's common knowledge that most murder victims knew their murderer in some way or another. Maybe it was a jealous ex, a bitter spouse, or a sketchy neighbor. But what about the cases where a victim doesn't know their attacker at all? What if a victim is chosen for no real reason? What happens when a killing is truly random? My name is Brandy, and today I'm gonna tell you about the thrill killing of Kimberly Cates. Now, what is a thrill killing? A thrill killing is a random murder committed solely for the excitement of the act. The killers in these cases kill just to kill, with no higher reason or purpose. The murder of Kimberly Cates is notable not only for its sheer brutality, but also for the randomness with which she was chosen. This gives it all the hallmarks of a thrill killing. Mont Vernon, New Hampshire is a small town of about 2,500 people. It should not be confused with Mount Vernon, Virginia, the historic plantation home of George Washington. There are 18 towns in the US named after Mount Vernon, but only one Mont Vernon. The residents of Mont Vernon are very particular about the spelling of their town's name. Theories abound as to why Mont Vernon is Mont and not Mount. Some suggest an old town clerk made a filing mistake one day and lost the U. Others say the French spelling of Mount is used due to the area's large French Canadian population. Whatever the origins of its unique name, Mont Vernon is an idyllic New England town about an hour's drive from Boston. It's the type of place that still has a general store, one that has been open for over 120 years in the same location. Residents celebrate their town's agricultural past with Lamson Farm Day on the last Saturday of every September. It would have been about a week later then, on October 4th, 2009, that the murder of Kimberly Cates would occur. Kimberly Cates was a 42-year-old nurse who worked at several hospitals in the region. She was known to love running, gardening, and attending karate class with her 11-year-old daughter, Jamie. Kimberly's husband, David Cates, was a contract engineer for the government. This meant he often traveled for work and was away from home for weeks at a time. The Cates had moved to Mont Vernon in 2004, partially for the well-known safety of the area. They lived on Trow Road, a dirt road in an outlying forested part of the town. This same isolation that provided peace and quiet would also make their home a prime target for our murderers. Yes, that is murderers, plural. On the night of Saturday, October 3rd, 2009, 11-year-old Jamie had fallen asleep in her mother's bedroom. David was away on business, as was common. Jamie awoke shortly before 4 a.m. in a totally dark house to her mother, Kimberly, asking, did you hear that? Kimberly got up and slowly walked to the open bedroom door where a man emerged from the darkness and attacked her with a machete. A second man appeared and grabbed Jamie, who attempted to defend herself, but she was no match for a full-grown man. Jamie was struck 18 times. Her jaw was shattered, part of her left foot was severed, and her skull was split open. The man then violently threw her against a glass door, breaking it in the process. Jamie fell down amidst the broken glass and blood, lying still and playing dead. It was this difficult decision, likely made in just a split second, that would thankfully save her life. Her mother, Kimberly, would not be so lucky. She suffered 36 blows from her attacker's machete. Several organs were pierced, her skull was split open, left eye socket destroyed, and several bones shattered. All the while, she pleaded with her attackers to stop. When this didn't work, she attempted to reassure her daughter and herself that everything would be okay. It was not these injuries that would kill her though, but the blood loss. Satisfied that Kimberly was dead, yet not bothering to check that Jamie was, the killers grabbed some jewelry and fled the house. 11-year-old Jamie, critically wounded, then managed to crawl to the kitchen and call the police. They killed my mommy, is all she was able to whisper. When the police arrived, they cleared the house and found that the murderers were long gone. There were signs of a break-in and that the home's power had been turned off, then on again. Jamie, on her way to the hospital, identified her attackers as two white men, one bald and the other in a hoodie. As the spouse is often the first suspect in a murder, David was initially suspected. However, when contacted, his innocence was quickly ascertained as he was in Maryland on business. 
He rushed home as quickly as he could to be by his daughter's side at the hospital. So who were the murderers of Kimberly Cates? Steven Spader, age 17, would later describe himself as the most sick and twisted person you'll ever meet. He was a former Boy Scout and had just got his GED after dropping out of high school. Spader was fascinated with the ideas of violence and mayhem. He even openly admired both the Manson family and the Zodiac Killer. Spader, a high school outcast, formed a club for other misfits that felt like him. However, he envisioned this club not as a social group, but more like a criminal brotherhood or a gang. They called themselves the Disciples of Destruction. The Disciples included Christopher Gribble, age 19, Spader's right-hand man, as well as Quinn Glover, 17, and William Marks, 18. After first designing a logo for his club, Spader decided that the next order of business would be initiation. But what would be a fitting initiation for a disciple of destruction? The only way, in Spader's mind, to bind his club together would be with blood. The blood of someone innocent. The blood of someone random. A random killing, he reasoned, would not be traced back to them. Plus, he more than anything just wanted to experience the act of killing another person. It didn't matter who that person was. Only that all four of the Disciples of Destruction engaged in the murder. Spader and his lackeys then spent a few days scouting homes in the Mont Vernon area, since they knew it to be remote. They settled on a home off Trow Road due to the further isolation of the houses and heavy forest cover. This chosen home, however, actually belonged to the Cates' neighbors. On the night of the home invasion, Spader would call a last-minute switch and target the Cates' residence when he noticed a security system installed on the neighbor's house. We're about to do the most evil thing this town has ever seen, Spader told his disciples. According to Gribble's later testimony, the gang first lowered marks in through a basement window, but he couldn't access the main floor, so they hauled him back out. All four then broke in by removing the AC unit in a porch window and crawling inside. Once inside, Gribble turned off the circuit breaker to plunge the house into darkness. On their way to the master bedroom, they looked for smaller items to steal and pawn. They found Jamie's iPod, which they used as their sole light source in the pitch black home. When they entered the master bedroom, a woman's voice called out, Jamie, is that you? Testimonies from both Marks and Gribble state that Spader attacked instantly, slashing at Kimberly with the machete he brought along. Spader then attacked Jamie with a knife throwing her into the glass door when she tried to defend herself. He believed her to be dead, so he didn't check on her. As this went on, Glover retreated to the living room, perhaps squeamish. Marx did not participate in the attack either, though he stood guard by the door and watched it happen. Spader had initially talked about making a scene for the press by eating people, putting heads on spikes, and roasting bodies, but none of this was done. As Spader and his gang left the Kate's home, they restored power to it to make it appear as though all was normal. On their way out, they stole one of David Kate's old wallets, a pearl necklace, and two wooden jewelry boxes. The next day, they would pawn these ill-gotten goods for about $130. So what went wrong for the Disciples of Destruction? They'd gone out of their way to target a random home, left no witnesses that they knew of, and tried to make it look like a burglary gone wrong. How were they caught? Well, the murder was a thrill killing, remember? And the killers bragged. By 5.30 a.m., less than 90 minutes after they had murdered Kimberly Cates, Spader and crew met up with another friend, Autumn Savoy. Spader had previously tried to recruit Autumn into the Disciples of Destruction, but he had been resistant to the idea of killing another person. Despite these reservations, Savoy had no problem at all with helping Spader dispose of the evidence. Spader, Gribble, and Savoy dumped the bloody clothes, shoes, and some of the stolen goods into the nearby Nashua River. The rest of the goods were pawned later that day. After bragging to Savoy and doing a poor job of getting rid of the evidence that wasn't sold, Spader and the group decided to split up and head back to their homes to sleep. But they wouldn't sleep or even remain apart for long. 
At 5.30 on October 4th, still the same day as the murder, Spader and Gribble would meet at another friend, Kyle Fenton's house. There, they bragged about breaking into a home, stealing some things, and killing two people. Spader and Gribble even showed Fenton the knives they'd used and mentioned a machete had also been involved. Accustomed to Spader's posturing and talk, Fenton believed his friends were lying. He thought they were just making up an elaborate story about murdering two people to act cool. After Spader and Gribble had left, Fenton saw a news report about the Mont Vernon home invasion and was faced with the sickening truth. His friends weren't lying. The next morning, October 5th, Fenton's mother, Carol, contacted the local police on behalf of her son. The police spoke with Kyle Fenton and noted that a lot of what Spader and Gribble had told him matched up with the specifics of the crime scene. Fenton also gave them the names of Marks and Glover. When he identified Spader and Gribble though, the police were shocked. The police knew who they were. After examining the crime scene, the police were on the lookout for any suspicious vehicles. Spader and Gribble had been pulled over earlier that day for speeding away from a police cruiser. They had been questioned and then let go. At school, a resource officer would notice an abnormally nervous and anxious teen and approach him. The student, who goes unnamed, would tell the officer that the day before, Sunday, the day of the murder, he took a lot of drugs while hanging out with Spader, Gribble, Marks, and Glover. All four were boasting about the attack. The student, like Kyle Fenton, didn't believe they were serious. However, Gribble went into graphic detail about stabbing both Kimberly and Jamie. He stated that it was awesome. Spader would say that he was looking forward to do it again. All of them then went to the mall together to pawn the stolen items. The items the student witnessed being pawned matched those taken from the Kate's home. The four boys then showed the student the machete Spader had used to attack Kimberly Cates. The machete was still in the trunk of Gribble's car. Spader told the student it had been covered in blood, but they'd cleaned it up using ammonia and bleach. This unnamed student then got a frantic call from his girlfriend. After all the talking and boasting the murderers had been doing, word was getting around. She asked if Mark specifically had been involved in the killing. He told her yes, he had been, and that all four of them were currently bragging about it. This student's girlfriend then likely talked to Glover's girlfriend, who called Spader to yell at him for getting Glover involved in a murder. Spader got angry and blamed the student for ratting him out. He and Gribble both pulled out knives and prepared to attack. The student managed to get away though. Glover blocked Spader and Gribble from attacking him, then Marks drove him home. The next day, the student was paranoid that Spader and Gribble would get him at school. It was this behavior that led the school resource officer to approach him and get him to talk. After their talks with Fenton and this unnamed student, the police set out looking for Spader and Gribble. They were found, along with Savoy, in Spader's family home. Four knives were confiscated from Gribble and the boys were taken into the police station. Glover and Marks were still at school and would later be brought in separately. Glover at first told police he'd been asleep at home the night of the murder. He'd later concede that he had actually been driving around Mont Vernon with Spader, Gribble, and Marks, but would say no more without an attorney. Marks, however, told the police everything. He told them about Spader saying, we're about to do the most evil thing this town has ever seen. He told them that since he was the smallest of the boys, he'd been lowered into the basement to find a way in, but he'd been unable to access the main floor. According to Marks, one of the others let him in through the basement door after they broke in by taking the AC unit out of the porch window. This conflicts slightly with Gribble's later testimony that he hauled Marks out of the basement before they all entered through the porch window. Marks told the police about someone cutting power to the house, stealing items, and using Jamie's iPod as a light source. He then said that when they entered the master bedroom, Spader had attacked Kimberly with a machete while Gribble attacked Jamie with a knife, then threw her into the glass door. Marks then admitted that he had been the one to help Spader scout houses in Mont Vernon for a potential target. He also mentioned that Spader had changed the plan at the last second, targeting 
making the Kates home instead of their original target. Overall, Marks gave up everything to the police. It was still the day after the murder. Next, the police would question Autumn Savoy. Savoy first said that Spader and Gribble couldn't have committed a murder that night as they showed up at his house at 2 a.m., smoked some pot, and gone to sleep. However, this flimsy lie didn't hold up under police pressure, and Savoy cracked almost immediately. He then said that Spader and Gribble had left his home late Saturday night, intent on killing someone. Savoy thought they were joking. He'd later text Spader if he was doing a job, here meaning burglary. At 1.30 a.m., Spader texted back, busy, we'll hit you when I can. At 5.30, Spader and Gribble showed back up at Savoy's house. They woke him up, told him they'd just killed two people, and showed him the bloody machete and knife. Savoy also noted that Spader and Gribble were wearing different clothes. They'd changed after the attack and wanted to burn their bloody clothes at his house. He talked them into throwing the bloody clothes into the nearby Nashua River instead. After throwing the bag of clothes, knives, and some of the stolen items into the river, the boys decided that the next step would be breakfast. They stopped at a convenience store for a snack. The time was 7 a.m. After being questioned, Savoy led the police to the spot along the river where they dumped the bags. Inside, they found the stolen items, David Kate's wallet, and bloody clothes that literally had the names of Spader and Gribble on the tags. Gribble was interviewed next. Unknown to Gribble, the police already had what they needed to put him away, but they wanted a confession. He first made up a story about going to the mall with his friends to buy cheap jewelry, then pawn it for profit. The police weren't buying it and informed him they were in the process of getting a warrant for his DNA. This gave Gribble pause. He asked the officer if the crimes they were investigating were eligible for the death penalty. The officer stated that he didn't think so. This was apparently good enough for Gribble and he started talking. First, Gribble said that the crimes were a conspiracy and that he and Spader were both psychopaths. A week prior to the murder, they had robbed a home near Spader's house. After running out of the money they made pawning the stolen goods, they decided to do it again. Spader and Marks then started driving around Mont Vernon looking for a home to target. They knew that Mont Vernon would make for an ideal location due to its remoteness. Next, Spader and Gribble decided that if they even burgled a home and found people inside, they'd have to kill them for fun. They made Marks and Glover agree to this as well. Gribble went on to essentially verify the story Marks had already told the police, but he added some new details. Around midnight on Sunday, October 4th, he and Spader meet up with Marks and Glover outside of Walmart. Spader had told them all not to drink or do any drugs, as they all needed to be sharp and present for what they were about to do. They changed their clothes, put on gloves, and piled into Gribble's car. Gribble dropped the other three off near the home they were originally targeting, then parked his car out of sight on a hill near a tractor. All four boys left their phones in the car. They didn't want them to go off while they were in the house. This is why they eventually needed to use Jamie's iPod as a light source. When Gribble caught up to the others, Spader had already made the call to target the Kate's home instead, as it didn't appear to have a security system. According to Gribble, he lowered Marks in through the basement window, then pulled him out when Marks couldn't open the door. This is the only piece of his confession that does not match that of Marks. They then broke in by removing the AC unit on the porch window. Spader, machete in hand, was first in. All four were armed with sharp weapons, yet only Spader and Gribble would actually use them. Gribble himself turned off the circuit breaker. They went room to room, stealing things as they went. When they entered the master bedroom, Spader attacked Kimberly with the machete, while Gribble stabbed Jamie in the face and chest before throwing her against the glass door, assuming she was dead. After making sure Kimberly was dead, they looked around for more items to steal before turning the circuit breaker back on and making their escape. Once back at Gribble's car, they changed clothes and threw all their bloody clothes into a black trash bag. They drove back to the Walmart, smoking cigars in the car to celebrate. Marx then left in his car alone, while Spader, Gribble, and Glover went over to Savoy's house to brag. 
Savoy helped them dispose of the bag of evidence in the river and was instructed to act as their alibi. He did attempt to follow through on this, but we've already seen how that went. The boys believed that they'd killed two people, but when they checked the news, they saw that Jamie had survived. Spader got combative and accused Gribble of failing to kill her. But Gribble said he'd wanted to kill someone for a long time. If he'd have known she was playing dead, he'd have made sure she actually was. Finally, the police spoke with the leader of the Disciples of Darkness, Spader. They already had what they needed, but wanted to see if he'd add anything to the story. Spader lied and put the blame entirely on Gribble. He said he had no clue who committed the murder, but that they deserved the death penalty. He then mentioned that he was with Gribble when he pawned the stolen jewelry, but he didn't know where it all came from. That was all the police got out of him before he refused to speak further without a lawyer. On Tuesday, October 6th, slightly more than 48 hours after the murder of Kimberly Cates, Spader, Gribble, Glover, and Marks were arraigned. Spader and Gribble were charged with first-degree murder, attempted murder, and conspiracy to commit murder, as well as a few other lesser charges. Marks and Glover were charged with burglary, conspiracy to commit burglary, and robbery. A month later, Savoy was charged with two counts of hindering apprehension or prosecution and one count of conspiracy to commit hindering apprehension or prosecution. Glover, Marx, and Savoy would all agree to testify against Spader and Gribble if the prosecutors did not pursue higher charges for them. Even incarcerated, Spader could not stop bragging. He wrote a letter to the public calling the people of the town uninformed idiots and attacking David Cates for protesting the inclusion of Glover and Marx in the school yearbook. In Spader's own words, it is not their fault that they were arrested and charged with what they were charged with. And yet through all the struggle, they both are still trying to get an education. Spader also wrote letters to Chad Landry, a fellow inmate of the maximum security section of the Hillsborough County Jail. In the letters, Spader described the preparation for the attack, the attack itself, and the hours after in vivid detail. Spader's trial wouldn't begin until August 2010. Despite all his bragging and talking, he pleaded not guilty. Spader's defense attorney argued that Spader had only claimed credit for the crimes as a way of getting attention, but that he hadn't actually committed them. A forensic scientist also testified that nothing tied Spader physically to the scene. But these were two weak arguments and were overshadowed by a slew of evidence and the testimonies of Spader's friends. Marx, Glover, and Savoy all testified against him, giving details about his brutal attack of Kimberly and his plan to use murder as an initiation into the Disciples of Darkness. Kyle Fenton also testified and told the court about Spader and Gribble visiting him at home. Spader himself openly threatened witnesses that were put on the stand, which did nothing to help his case. His attorney tried to claim that the others were setting him up as a scapegoat for the crime. Chad Landry, the fellow inmate Spader had been writing to, also took the stand against him. Landry presented all the letters that Spader had sent to him. He'd save them all for potential leverage while pretending to flush them down the toilet. A handwriting expert would attest that the letters were written in Spader's handwriting. The jury deliberated for only 90 minutes before convicting Spader on all charges. On the day of his 19th birthday, Spader was found guilty of two counts of first-degree murder, attempted murder, conspiracy to murder, conspiracy to burglary, and witness tampering. He was sentenced to life without parole as well as another 76 years for the attempted murder of Jamie Cates. According to The Telegraph, a Nashua newspaper, Judge Gillian Abramson made each of the sentences consecutive to one another to ensure that Spader stay in that cage for the rest of his pointless life. Gribble would be the next to go to trial, where he would plead not guilty by reason of insanity. Under New Hampshire law, this meant that Gribble was essentially confessing to the charges against him, but it was up to his lawyers to prove that he had committed them while not in the right mind. They'd argue that he suffered from antisocial personality disorder. 
A friend of his would say that while Gribble was intelligent and spoke well, he had a warped worldview where he saw himself as a destroying angel, something no sane person would ever say. Gribble himself would say that he'd been dreaming of murdering his mother for years due to her abuse. These abuse allegations would never be corroborated. According to WMUR New Hampshire, in his statement to police, Gribble said he had wanted to kill someone for a long time and was disappointed he didn't feel any emotion following the Kate's killing. He told police that he and the others planned on burglarizing the home and killing anyone who might be there, just for fun. During the trial, he'd go on to say he just felt nothing. It was kind of cool because it was different. It was a curiosity, like, oh, that's what bones look like. On the moment when he cut Kimberly Kate's throat, he said he moved very carefully from the carotid artery and had to adjust at one point because he got the angle wrong. This spoke to a precision and thought that went into the murder and did not help his plea of insanity. The prosecution would then argue that Gribble knew the difference between right and wrong. He'd been of sound enough mind to plan, commit, and cover up a murder. His own testimony even showed his precision and cold heartedness. The jury would convene for two hours and then reject Gribble's insanity plea. They declared him guilty of first degree murder, attempted murder, conspiracy to commit murder, conspiracy to commit burglary, and witness tampering. Gribble was sentenced to life without the possibility of parole, plus 50 years to life, as well as an additional 52 years for other charges. Marx pled guilty to conspiracy to commit murder and burglary, as well as being an accomplice to first degree assault. In exchange, he got a reduced sentence of only 30 to 60 years in prison. Glover pled guilty to robbery, burglary, and conspiracy to commit burglary for a reduced sentence of 20 to 40 years. Savoy pled guilty to conspiracy and hindering apprehension and prosecution for a reduced sentence of 5 to 12 years. He was paroled in 2015. In 2012, the Supreme Court ruled that any minor sentenced to life in prison would be allowed a resentencing hearing. Spader declined his, but a hearing was held anyway. His life plus 76 year sentence was upheld. Gribble would seek a reduced sentence though. His sentence would also be upheld. In the aftermath of the trials, Mont Vernon would try to return to normal. The murder of Kimberly Cates was an awful affair that rocked a small, otherwise peaceful town. David and Jamie Cates would stay out of the public eye and continue to heal. Lamson Farm Day would continue on and the general store would remain open. Yet many residents would purchase guard dogs or guns to protect themselves. There's no such thing as an innocent stranger anymore, one resident would tell the New Hampshire Union leader. What do you think of the senseless tragedy at Mont Vernon? Did Marx and Glover get cold feet by not actually participating in the murder? Did they perhaps feel any of the remorse that wasn't felt by Spader and Gribble? Please let us know your thoughts in the comments below. Thank you for watching Killer Bites. I'll see you next time.